everyone, and welcome to another episode of Dead Air, a horror podcast. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that we do have a Facebook group that you can join. Join us in Dead Air, a horror podcast. And um, we also have, sorry, that is our Facebook page. We also have a group that you can join, which is Dead Air. Uh, over there, you can talk about anything horror related. And we have a nice little community over there. So we'd like to give a shout out to everybody in the Dead Air group. Hello. I hope you guys are still good. Um, today is going to be a really, really fun episode. And I'd like every, everyone to also check out our social media on Instagram. We have an Instagram account at Dead Air Pod. Over there, you can actually message that account and give us any suggestions. If you have any suggestions of guests that you want on the show or any movies that you'd like us to talk about, just let us know over there. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Dead Dare, a horror podcast. Brought to you by Big Baby Studios. So today's episode, oh my gosh, everybody... We are in for a treat because today we have writer and director of 2022's The Leech. He's also known for the film's sadistic intentions and was part of ABC's Of Death 2.5. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Eric Penkoff. Hello. Thank Hello. you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. This is very exciting. Yes, uh, we'd like to introduce ourselves also on this podcast. So um, I'm one of the hosts. My name is Aaron. And the reason why I am part of this podcast is because I really enjoy the thrill that horror movies bring. So I'm one of those people that go to the movie houses with their friends and watch horror movies and just enjoy. Um, but of course, on we have to have um, a more expert professional on the show not just somebody who likes this stuff someone who knows about this stuff so my co-host chris will talk about himself <laughs> I'm sorry. um yeah i'm chris um, i'm not an expert in any way but i am an obsessive so i'm i'm uh I'm, I'm obsessed with horror i'm super big fan it's pretty much all i watch uh to be honest mm. with you. um yeah so so that that's uh that makes up me and aaron make up kind of the general um you know uh general audience of, of horror of horror watchers you know you got you someone who really just loves the thrill of watching and yeah. feeling scared and then you have someone who's just like obsessed i guess yeah, yeah. <laughs> crazy obsessed that's that's what i'm trying to say yeah that's really all you talk about actually chris that's all yeah it's i have turned it into my personality sadly and uh, my, my my wife isn't so happy about that but yeah <laughs> that's uh that's where i am right now yeah. So, hi, Eric. We're so happy to have you here. Um, you'll be surprised to know that the horror community in the Philippines is actually pretty big. And uh, we want to know a little bit more about you. So, um, let's start with your horror origin. What got you into horror in the first place? Well, thank you for having me. This is very exciting. It's I, one of the things I love about horror the most, and especially getting movies out into the world, is that, you know, horror really is this international language. I mean, there are very few genres that kind of uh you know can reach as far as they do and i think it's a, a testament to the sort of like the worldwide appeal of, of horror and being scared is a pretty pretty natural thing but you know my i guess really the first thing that got me into scary stuff was when i was a kid i worked at a haunted house and you know halloween time in america in the midwest where i grew up which is very rural you know whether someone had a, a haunted house in their backyard or in more uh, you know, professional attraction. It was, it was just kind of this crazy thing. You know, once uh, once a year, people just found it okay to be into crazy stuff. Where a lot of us were into that year around, but it was like the one month a year where it was like, okay, people kind of understood you if you were a weird kid that liked <laughs> monsters or dinosaurs or horror movies or all the stuff that like, I don't know, kids grew up liking. Um, so yeah, I worked at a haunted house. I got, I did it for free. They paid me in pizza. There was a group of us that. <laughs> You know, from um, eighth grade through actually half of high school, I spent my weekend evenings working at a haunted house. So I didn't have uh, too much of a social life outside <laughs> of that until until later of high school. But yeah, I don't know. It was something about, um, you know, seeing what the place looked like when it was an active attraction, seeing it when the lights were on, kind of seeing behind the curtain. I think uh, this obsession with building worlds kind of started there, just the idea that you could 
you know, it could be a bright sunny day on the outside of this building. And on the inside, it was like, you know, full of body bags yeah. and chain. And Michael Myers was walking <laughs> around. And I, I don't know, something about that separation. I was also the type of kid that grew up loving roller coasters mm. and playing laser tag because laser tag arenas kind of had a similar otherworldness to it. So yeah, I think a lot of it had to do with just sort of, you know, you grow up in a rural area with not allowed to do, but every once in a while, there are these weird attractions and things that pop up that kind of get you thinking like cinematically a little bit. Mm. What what was your role in the haunted house? Were you one of the people that scared others or you were? Oh, <laughs> yeah. nice. Well, were yeah, you? yeah, that was, uh, I mean, you know, you, they kind of moved you around on different nights, but at a certain point towards the end, there was this room that no one wanted to work in except for me because essentially, you know, a haunted house is very dark, but there would be this one room you would walk into and it was painted white and it was doused with so much fog. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face and a strobe light flickered. So the small room felt infinite. It felt like you had no perception of where you were walking. And then also on top of that played the theme song to the exorcist on the loop. Oh, wow. Whoa. So, <laughs> oh, nice. That, that theme with that room was uh, a solid couple years of my life, but it was so cool because <laughs> people would walk into it and they would be completely overwhelmed by the effect. Cause you're, you're in, you know, dark rooms for so long. And then suddenly you're blasted with this like white flickering light. Sure. Wow. It sounds like, uh, have you seen the, I'm sure you have, but, but Hell House, LLC? I've not, no, no. People wow. have been telling me I need to watch those movies, though. Yeah, well, well, it, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a found footage horror film set in a haunted house. It's, and it's about a p- bunch of people who are setting up that haunted house and like weird shit happens. I think you'd love it. it it's, it's really good. It's really good. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. But that, that's like a, very, a big part of my childhood. Sorry, I'm very curious about this haunted house because I love haunted houses. I love it. I, I love the, the novelty of it. What, what would you do? Were you like a, a patient or what, what was your, um, how would you scare them? I remember distinctly being like 13 years old when I started doing this. And I was wow. so excited that at home I took a white dress shirt and I threw red paint on it. Ooh. And then I showed up basically with like a doctor's mask on and my own custom made shirt. Like I showed up on my first day on the job, like prepared to scare people. <laughs> I think I think they probably looked at me like, uh, well, we have these black cloaks you can wear. Because, <laughs> you know, some some people had specific like outfits. Like there was a Michael Myers room. So there was one Michael Myers, you know, there's the chainsaw people. But for the most part, if you were a little kid that was volunteering to do this, they would just throw you in a black cloak and kind of <laughs> like let you creep around and pop out from behind corners. Um, but yeah, I, I made my own uh, pseudo leather wow. face outfit. I had the tie that was loose <laughs> hanging down. Uh, yeah, it's a very, uh, maybe the most prepared I've ever been for a job. <laughs> love it. You were your own stylist. I love yeah, pretty that. Pretty much. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of the beginning of it. But so- you were exposed to all of this, sorry, at such a young age that, um, I mean, you, you seem to like horror at, at, at such a young age, but I wanted to ask because you were exposed to all of these like haunted house things. What's something that actually scares you? Because you mm. see, you know, you see all of these things. I'd think that you're kind of numb to it already after having worked in a haunted house, but what scares you? You know, I think before, uh, when I was a kid, I was very afraid of the dark, just a very mm. simple primal fear. Um, you know, I've not seen this new movie that everyone's talking about. Skinamarink, I think is how you say it. Yeah. Um, but you know, it, it sounds like it's tapping into something that maybe little kids in the nineties experienced waking up in a house by yourself and it's dark and house feels so much bigger than it is. So I, I had a very simple fear, but when I worked at that haunted house, you know, I saw it with the lights off, with the lights on. And I think actually taking on that job was kind of a, a weird way that kind of helped me tackle that fear a little bit. And I think that's a very common thing for horror movies to help people get through uh, weird states of mind at different points mm-hmm. in their life. But yeah, I think definitely that job kind of helped me um, get over just the basic fear of the dark. Because I remember even the first night that I worked there, I was working there and I was kind of scared because I was in this place that you know was a scary place and it was dark and i was you know with a lot of people that i didn't know which is kind yeah. of a, a scary thing but you know over a couple of years of working there i think it it gave me perspective and kind of made me really appreciate the craft of the craft of being spooky i guess mm. <laughs> i'm a, i'm well, I, I love horror but my god i'm telling you right now i cannot be in a haunted house what i cannot i just can't it's the physical 
it, it's just, it's, it's just, I don't know. I cannot, like, I, I get panic attacks. Um, <laughs> it's, it's the anticipation and it's like real, you know, anticipation. It's like, like with a movie, you have this, you know, you have the safety net of being able to stop something or pause something. Right. But like in a haunted house, it's just, Everything I feel everything's so assaulting. Like there's there's the there's the you know the the visuals, there's there's the sound, and then you just know someone's just right behind you about to like you know <laughs> scare you. So yeah, I, I'm really not good with haunted houses. And they really <laughs> fuck you up on purpose. Like I remember yes. I went to a haunted house, they will separate you from your friends. Exactly. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's wild. It's wild. What 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 is the uh is the haunted house landscape like? Where where you both grew up? I mean, you know, <laughs> it's um, it's comical. Yeah, <laughs> it's a little comical. Um, the budget is not the best, no, so no, no. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes when when people come out to scare you, you you yell just because you're surprised, and then you laugh because yes. the costumes yeah. are so bad. It's horrible. Yeah, it's just jump scares, but then it's just like, oh, it's lipstick, you know, or or, <laughs> or pow- white powder on someone's face, like yeah. yeah. We There's have something a, charming about that, though. Yeah. It, there, it's definitely charming. It's definitely charming. There was this one time we had this um, zombie marathon run. Mm-hmm. So um, you're running, and then there are zombies that chase you, so it gets your heart rate up. But then by the end of the day, the zombies were so tired that they were just asking people for cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so when, when I was our culture. <laughs> when I, when I was 13 years old working at this, it was also kind of my introduction to people that were maybe only a few years older than me that felt like they were fully formed adults. We're talking like 16 year old, 17 year old kids smoking cigarettes and probably drinking beers out back. Yeah, with yeah, me yeah. not being very aware of it at that young of an age, but slowly catching on that there's a. You know, the people that work the haunted house, they like to party also. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> and that's the difference. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <Over there. laughs> All right. So let's jump into your film. Let's talk a little bit about The Leech. But before that, um, for those that haven't seen The Leech, um, do you mind giving us like a little synopsis about it? Yeah, uh, the leech is about this Catholic priest that helps a struggling couple off the street around Christmas time, uh, gives them shelter for uh, a couple of nights with the, uh, with the offer of helping reform their lives. Cause in his mind, they live a very uh, unholy life. So it's about this guy that, you know, starts off trying to help a couple of people and it fully backfires into his face and enters sort of psychologically terrifying, uh, areas that, uh, sort of put him through a test of faith. Mm, yes, we did see it, and yes, yes. <laughs> it, was, it was a journey. Um, it was a journey. It was and for a, a short for a for a movie that wasn't that long. It was yeah, a journey. Yeah, a lot happened. Um, so so the leech. Uh, just so everyone knows, please go to our our Facebook page. You'll see it is on the our top of the year. Um, we're big fans of the leech. Um, but basically, um, it's um. It is really something that for, for me anyway, it is really something that I, I went to it with, with nothing, uh, no knowledge. I didn't even watch a trailer. I just saw it on a bunch of, you know, top 10 lists. And I was like, okay, well, I got, I got to see this. And then, yeah, I think this again, I always say this on the podcast. The best way to watch something is to just not watch a trailer. Um, because- I don't know. I, I got intrigued by the trailer because the trailer <laughs> had words yes. like horny. <laughs> horrifying. I was like, wait a minute. This, this, is, how we, this, this. Yeah, this is how yeah. we do marketing in 2022. We just cut to the chase. It's either blood, <laughs> horny, horny, violence. Horrifying. You know. yeah. I love that that was a review. Horny. I was like, oh, yes. I want to see this movie. <laughs> yeah, no, the, uh, yeah, the, the people, you know, Aero Video, who I've been a fan of for years, they, they did a great job cutting uh, what I think is uh, a really, really fun ad campaign without giving too much away. I think there's still a lot to be discovered and revealed. But yeah, um, you know, I'm I'm a fan of exploitation films and all those all those sleazy movies from multiple decades that kind of just give you give you what you want and they cut to the cut to the chase as far as the advertisements go so (laughs) the fact that they were the fact that they were willing to distill it down to single word reviews. I I was into it. And don't worry, like it didn't give anything away, guys. Yeah, nothing, nothing, <laughs> nothing. not at all. <laughs> I did not expect the movie to be like that after that trailer. 
You <laughs> well, <laughs> well, it did. It did tell us that it was horny and horrifying. So, I did get so, yeah. that too. Yeah, yeah. it yeah. delivered. It Not delivered. false it, it, advertising. It, 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 as, as long as we delivered, that's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, what inspired the leech for you? It's 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 a very like I said, like a lot's happening. It's a very very. Uh, I feel it's a very dense movie. Um, there's a lot to talk about. It's very. It's very deep. Like there, there's a lot of stuff that you think is just surface level, but it's um it, it's it's saying a lot. And we, I'm sure we're gonna get into that uh, in in this conversation. But like, what inspired it for you? Well, I think just wanting to make another movie and being um you know sort of pent up and frustrated during the first few months of the pandemic, and knowing mm-hmm. that you know uh, hearing a lot of people saying oh uh, you know the future of film is filmmakers needing to learn how to make small movies without a lot of Mm. money or very few actors. And I think a lot of us micro budget indie filmmakers were kind of looking at each other being like, well, this is what we were already doing before the pandemic. Like we never have a lot of money. We always have like a couple locations. Um, You know, you don't have a lot of actors, but hopefully the actors you have, I think are really good. Um, And, you know, working with two of the cast that I worked with before was a big part of it, Mm -hmm. wanting to put them in something again. And, you know, making a movie that in scale was kind of similar to my first movie, but it was hopefully doing things stylistically that were different and things that I was interested in. Um, I think the very basic setup of being stuck with someone or someone in your house, I think we've all experienced uh, a freeloader or a cousin or a brother (laughs) or a sister or whoever, people that overstay their welcome. I think I think maybe someone overstaying their welcome is as universal a thing as horror in general. (laughs) Um, we've all opened our homes or been guests in other people's homes. And, you know, you put people in close quarters for too long. Uh, things can go a variety of directions. And when you're making a horror movie, you know, you want that direction to be the craziest <laughs> thing you can think of. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, th- I think the the very basic, the foundations of that kind of movie came pretty quickly. But when I started to think about, you know, who might have the tolerance for a freeloader, um, I started to think a lot about a Catholic priest because I was raised Catholic and I know those characters and I know sort of um, where their threshold is and what their tolerance is. And, you know, anyone that claims to be a man of God is probably going to have more tolerance than someone like me if <laughs> they were acting that way at my house. So, you know, it's um, it's kind of like uh, it, it, the, the classic setup is used in a lot of comedy movies. You know, a lot of people have been making comparisons to like John Candy movies. And I think I think that same trope kind of finds its way through comedy as well. And, you know, there's not much of a difference between a comedy and a horror. So it's mm-hmm. fun to combine the two and it's fun to kind of split them where they need to be split and let them mash together where it, it feels like it works to mash them together. But, you know, really, I, I wouldn't have the confidence to kind of make a movie like this with so few people where everything hinges on the performances if I didn't happen to be, you know, friends with a few really great actors that I I think are worth making a movie with. Um, mm-hmm. Ultimately, you're you're looking at people in a movie and if the, the people aren't good or they're not interesting, it's um, everything else kind of falls apart. So it's kind of a combination of a lot of different things. And I, I think really just the, the frustration of wanting to make another movie, just feeling like I, I needed to make something. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, sorry, sorry, Aaron, go ahead. No, I was going to say, um, the, the Philippines is a largely Catholic country. Yes. Mm-hmm. So this resonated very much. Very with much. Us, yes. With yeah. our leaders as well. <laughs> They're, you know, it's just, yeah. it's all together. The <laughs> government and church, same, same. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, um, a lot of the, um, the the ideas that were were being um, said in the movie was something that that really, you know, it, it, I resonated with it because I hear it all the time. Yeah, um, yeah, that's it. That's all I want to say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's no, there's because, no question. I just wanted to say that. Yeah, because again, like uh, like Aaron hit on hit the nail on the head. Like it, we're we're an extremely religious country, um, and but but you know now that we. we we're adults. We grew up being kind of indoctrinated into Catholicism mm. and, and organized religion. And, uh, so, so, and then you, and then growing up, you see, you see, uh, you know, a, a bit of hypocrisy here and there. You see a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And then, and then, you know, so, 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 I, you know, again, she, she's right. Like we, 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 a lot of the film really resonated with <laughs> us, at least, you know, being, um, um, uh, predominantly Catholic country. Um, and yeah, so, so, um, wh- one of the things what I really want to ask, uh, right off the bat, uh, Eric was, is, is that, uh, 
I, I've I've read a few reviews of of the leech, and uh, it, it's it's been kind of compared to. Uh, have you seen Speak No Evil this year? I haven't, but a lot of people have been telling me that it, it yes. makes a hell of a double feature with it. <laughs> yes, exactly. Extremely different films, but like at, at, at their core, it's about you know like. It, it's about people avoiding conflict and trying hard not to, yeah, not to just, it, it's just very cringe. It's very, you know, like, you know, how, how, how you deal with people trying to take from you and just trying to just, you know, you know, just abuse, abuse everything that you're giving them. Um, and it's, it's just, they're extremely different films, but the themes are so similar. Um, so, so, so yeah, uh, if you haven't seen it, of course, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's both of those films are on, 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 on our top of the year. Uh, so it, it was, it was something that I want to bring up, but, uh, yeah, you should check it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, well, you know, you, you make a movie like this and, you know, there's a lot of people have said like, oh, it seems like it's hitting at such a relevant time. And there, yeah. there is a, a, a single issue in the film that is definitely poignant, but I think the bigger, some of the bigger relevancy, I, I tell people, I said, you know, you make any movie about religion or any movie about violence or any movie about war. It's like, unfortunately, it's always going to be kind of relevant. And, you know, what feels like very relevant issues, especially here in the States, hearing that in the Philippines, it's the same. And, that, you know, there's just these things that just seem to be uh, constant, endless cycles within different cultures and countries. It's It's frightening. And I... You know, that's ultimately, I think, what film and art is here to do is to, uh, I don't know, contextualize it or do something to help us get past it. Um, doesn't see, it seems like it's not working well enough these days. <laughs> you know, you can keep making these movies and it seems like it's, it's not causing anything to, uh, to stop or cease in the world. But yeah, um, certainly, uh, I, I think in the last couple of years with the pandemic, um, people living within close quarters. I mean, I know multiple people, including myself, that shacked up with family members for a period of time and just so many lives were uh, changed, you know, and, and sure. sort of getting getting to know people in, an, in a whole new way, I think was very frightening in its, in its own sense. Mm. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> were there any challenges filming this? Because you filmed this during the pandemic, right? We did. And it was challenging, especially the first week. Uh, mm -hmm. Once we got through that first week and we had all tested negative, I, I felt better because I was very, Ooh. very strict okay. as we had to be about uh, 10 people made this movie and we never, mm -hmm. we never left the locations that we shot uh -huh. in. Um, so, you know, whereas even my first film, it was a small crew, but maybe someone would show up on a weekend or an evening to help out just family member or a friend lending their hand. It was, it was different on this because it was no one in, no one out, 10 people. It was, you know, a cast of four and a crew of six did this entire film. So, um, you know, we were, we, we were each other's bubble, which was very frightening the first week. But I think, I think once we got into it, we found that there was an incredible level of focus that you can put towards making a movie when there's, you know, no dinner to go out to, or there's nothing to do on a weekend. It's, you know, sure. we were, we, we, we were in it for a solid three weeks. Mm. It was a three week uh, production. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Three, five day weeks. Y'all are close now. <laughs> yeah. We, Wait, this, entire, we, we, this entire film was shot in three weeks, 15 days. Yeah. Yeah. So we were wow. with, with each other for three weeks, but we did not shoot on the weekends. So it was a Monday mm. through Friday, but then on the weekends, we just, we lived in these locations and we watched movies and, you know, some of us would be prepping sets and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, art design for the next week and things like that. How, how, how close was it from your script to like the final, the final product? It was very close. And I think it was, it maintained very close because, you know, I, I explained to the cast when we were rehearsing very much like we're doing now over Zoom all those months in advance that, you know, there were a lot of things I wanted to try, but, you know, I was also as a producer, so uh, on edge just about the time and COVID mm -hmm. to where I said, let's really, let's just nail, let's nail the script. Like, let's really just go through the script scene by scene, line by line and get this to be uh, perfect and shoot ready. So we're not kind of fumbling around on set, trying to figure something out that could have been figured out right now. I think because I was so nervous. Mm. Nervous? How come? In, I mean, obviously... As, 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 well, things, but. as as the producer of the film and bringing 10 people together from three different states uh, sure. during the pandemic pre-vaccine. So there was no vaccine yet. 
Got it. Also, wow. we were a, a few months out. From so this when was, was this was this was 2020, like right. This now. was the bit the uh, January of 2021. Got yeah 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 yeah. yeah. So it right, wasn't right there yeah. at the beginning. Sure. So that was that was very nerve wracking, and I think um, I think a lot of those things that sort of had me on edge as a producer actually helped me become a better director because I I built the schedule for the film. I really sort of shot listed and sort of AD to the whole thing myself. So a lot of, a lot of the practical things that go into getting a movie up and off the ground, uh, not so different than being a wedding planner, to be honest. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> or an event coordinator. Uh, a lot hard. of those things. It is very hard. Yeah. yeah. You, you just, you have to be an endless source of positivity for everyone that feels as though sure. things are impossible. Um, but that's what makes it fun. And once you're doing it, then it's all worth it. But, um, yeah, to taking this on as the producer as well, uh, yeah. solely on my own this time was, was a, a big aspect of shooting during the pandemic and kind of structuring it the way we did. How, uh, okay. So, so you wrote, directed and produced this number. So this two part question, which, which part of the process did you, do you prefer? And also, and then, and then secondly, as a follow up, did you ever feel like, your your director hat was fighting against your producer hat. Mm. No, it never felt like there was a conflict between the two. Um, I definitely had the producer hat on for longer during pre production and during the whole um, you know developing of the script and getting everything together for it. Um, and I know I, th- I think um, I-, I can't think of exactly who, but I remember watching a lot of films before I made this that sort of maybe informed it stylistically, and there was this strange coincidence that all the directors also had a producer credit. And, Mm. you know, my first film, I was not a producer on it. I had great producers that I worked with, but when it came time to make this movie, it was much smaller and it was really me getting it off the ground. I think having, uh, having the ability to produce this from top to bottom, um, really sort of added a, a level of understanding to just the, the fundamentals of film production. Um, you know, scheduling, especially and figuring out how to make your days and doing something that builds out to be a good movie, but also is you know, economic and you're not pushing people too hard because it was a very uh, crazy, uncertain time. Yeah. 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 Would you say that because you took on so many roles, this is the movie that's the closest to you? I think so. I think I certainly had, I had the most, um, you know, I can look at this film and every, of course, everything I did as a director, I, I can break down, but sort of some of the logistics and the the planning and orchestration that went into it, I was, you know, at the forefront of, whereas, you know, I wasn't as, as involved in the scheduling of my first movie. Um, you know, I had a very great lo- relationship with the, the first DP I ever worked with in shot listing, but um, definitely scheduling and being the AD, you know, sort of self-imposed AD helped a lot. Mm-hmm. What was, was there any, so we talked about like challenges in general, working around COVID, working around, um, you know, uh, tight set, you're the producer. Were there, was there any, like, if we just kind of go to a micro level, were any scenes that were really difficult to shoot for you? Well, the never have I ever seen was always one that we knew we would commit an entire night to. Okay. Um, and my DP, Ramel, was very, uh, very great at breaking down, helping me break down how we would sort of structure that throughout the night because sure. we did commit. I think it was maybe 14 or 15 pages in the script, something like that. <laughs> so that was, that's definitely a lot of pages to shoot a single night. But, um, you know, having, having a solid DP who can really help you work through those things is instrumental for these small films. Um, you, you really have to have someone behind the camera who's willing to wear multiple hats and really lead the charge in a way uh, that is very similar to a director with, uh, you know, having have strong ideas and uh, a, a sort of a swift way to execute everything um, is really the only way that these small movies get made is a really great DP, sure. um, you know, and a, and a lot of people that are willing to work for not a lot and kind of give it their all for something that they believe in, which means you really have to deliver a script that you feel good about and ultimately cut together a film that is, you know, worth everyone's time. But that was a long night. That was definitely a scene. You know, anything we shot in the church had a very uh, specific set of parameters and <laughs> sort of guises that we were operating under, uh, mostly meaning the people that let us shoot there weren't entirely sure what we were doing. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, the, yeah. the, these are the things you do as an independent filmmaker. You're, uh, you know, you're kind of... Um, 
wheeling and dealing and saying certain things and half truths and you know <laughs> letting people know that you're not here to cause any problem. Um, we also had a snowstorm that looked great on camera and kind of worked to our advantage that kept a lot of people that ran the place uh, not wanting to come out during a blizzard and <laughs> see, a, see a movie get filmed. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and there was um, there was definitely uh, some some serendipity or you know some sort of uh, energy working in our favor, just aesthetically and sort of the way it gave us the freedom to have that location and not sure. be bothered. Man, that that uh, that never have I ever seen. That was when I felt that the the tone of the film really changed. Chaotic. It got <laughs> yeah. Like, whoa, whoa, what's <laughs> happening? And it was like so much information was being, you know, uh, uh, laid out in front of you, like one after another. And then you're like, oh, oh, damn. Okay, okay. And then like I really felt the tone changed. And uh, yeah, so that that I, that's easily one of my favorite scenes in the film. Well, it was one that we were, you know, probably I, I was always the most worried about because it's a lot of pages. Really? You're always trying to avoid too much exposition in a story. But, sure. you know, I, I guess I felt that if exposition is being revealed during a game that has forward momentum, at least it maybe wouldn't feel like the movie is stopping to tell you a bunch of stuff about people, which, you know, you never want to do with a movie. You always want to feel like there's forward momentum. Um but yeah, you know, I, I it's uh, when, when I got some early feedback, even during rough cuts, it seemed like the the tone of that scene was was working for most people. So that was it was very good to hear because it's a, definitely a crucial scene, and you know, you, you want it to feel natural. You don't want anything to feel like it stops and changes gears. But um, so if it felt like it came out in a, a natural way, I think that's probably the best compliment you can get. Oh. were there any scenes that surprised you, like when you saw it? Um, eventually in its final form. I mean, I wouldn't say that it surprised me because I, I knew he was great and I wanted to work with him, but Rigo Garay, he, anytime I got to cut his scenes together, I mean, he's just, he has so much charisma and I was just cutting his scenes, just laughing hysterically because he's <laughs> so good. And, you know, it also brought back conversations that him and I were having in pre-production about who this guy is, his music background, him and David's background. You know, you get little bits of that that are revealed in the story but it just i don't know something about building that character and talking to rigo early on about what we were going to do with this character in this movie just um you know I, I was so happy to see it come together and just gel with the rest of the story that is a uh, very fond memories thinking about R rigo has is is like really like all his scenes are so funny honestly you just don't realize that they're funny um but but like the, the that whole the the rap scene oh my god the rap it, it, was it, wow it was that just was, wow that was so that, good. it was so good it was so good it was like so cringe good yeah. like like yeah so so yeah that's that's another yeah that, oh wow you yeah, know his uh he, he was telling me i think it was sometime during production he goes uh you know, I can never show my mother this movie because, like, she would, she goes, she would, she would never let you in the house. He's like, if she, if you showed up on my mother's doorstep and she saw this movie, she would probably like try to call The Exorcist or something. Oh so, God. you know, it, he, Rigo, and I, I think, as far as people on the, uh, at least of the cast, him and I were the only ones that had sort of like strict Catholic upbringings. He had sure. very much a, a similar background, you know. So him and I. Uh, you know, got along well over, uh, you know, sort of what fun we would have with that. Um, but yeah, it's something about, you know, he's, he's so great at playing things straight. I mean, he's a great comedic actor as well. Everything he's been in is amazing, but you know, he just, uh, he just has these like beautiful, shiny eyes that I, I, <laughs> some, some people just have that face that is just like made for movies and Rio has that face. <laughs> yeah. He, he was fantastic. Actually, all the performances were great. I mean, like one of my favorite. Yeah, one of the standouts, obviously, of the film for me is is just really how everyone just kind of they just seem to gel as actors. Um, there was so much; uh, they seem like they're so comfortable with each other. Um, you know, uh, yeah, really great performances. Uh, um, Father David and Terry and Rigo, of course. Um, everyone just really like again for 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 a film with roughly four people in it, uh, you're you're so captivated by all the performances. So you know. Um, yeah, just incredible choice. Um, really great, great uh, people you're working with. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, when you have these, again, you have these small movies and you don't have a lot of time and you don't have a lot of money and you really want to make something. It's, 
you know, a good actor is the best special effect you can ever ask for, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's if you don't have, you know, huge camera cranes or explosions or these different things, it's like, there's always, even at the center of movies that have those, there, there still has to be really great actors. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm very fortunate to, you know, be friends and have made friends with people that I, I think are really great actors. So, you know, I keep putting them in movies as, as long as I can. And as long as I have something that, you know, feels like they fit. I guess with Jeremy and Taylor, they were in my first movie and these are two totally different characters than what they portrayed in Sadistic Intentions. But I remember during that movie, I was just, I just had so many things in my mind that I could see the two of them doing mm -hmm. um, both as a couple and independently. So, you know, there's a, uh, Lots more stuff I'd love to do with all these people. Mm. Oh, can't wait. Um, yes. were, you, were you surprised at the critical reception of, of Leech? Because honestly, like it, it's it's everywhere. I think it's universally acknowledged that it's it's really like you know. I saw a tweet where it said like if you, if the if the Leech isn't in your top ten of the year, you haven't seen the Leech. You know, and I think <laughs> I think. I, I think that kind of, you know, encapsulates uh, a Sets general reaction. Bar. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> were you surprised at, at, at this reaction? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, it's surprised, I don't know. I, I think you honestly just try not to think about it too much. I mean, it's, it's naive to say you don't think about it at all, because, of course, any filmmaker that spends years of their lives imagines, like, how great it'll be if everyone likes this movie. But you also know that, you know, this is a subjective medium, and there's going to be people that like yeah. it, and there's going to be people that don't like it. Um, I think the thing, maybe the more like practical answer would be, I was very, I was relieved to know that I think in general, the comedy worked for people um, because I also really edited, worked. I also edited this film and, you know, you spend months sitting in a dark room by yourself, like showing rough cuts to, to friends remotely over Vimeo for a while. And, you know, they say, they'll say nice things about it here and there, but it wasn't really until you know, I even got to see it with an audience in London last August. It's the first time I really got to be in a room with people and hear the laughter start <laughs> and spread that I, I felt a very practical sense of like, okay, at least myself as the editor didn't fuck things up. Yeah. That, it, that, it, that at least, you know, the, the writing I think is there and that the, the timing and the cut worked to elicit laughs at the right time. So I'm um, very happy about that. But, you know, as far as people liking it or not liking it, you know, I, I get why people don't or maybe aren't as into it. You know, it's uh, there's some rough characters to watch. And I think there's definitely more of a conversation going on culturally about, you know, are these likable characters or not? And that kind of begs the question like, well, are they meant to be likable or are they not meant to be likable? Is the choice to have them be, you know, <laughs> nice or bad people sort of playing into the the bigger story that you're telling. Um, I think all of it's valid. And I think, you know, just some people don't have as much of a tolerance for uh, liking to watch horrible situations unfold. But mm -hmm. I, think, I, I, I think most horror fans do. Yeah. <laughs> I actually wanted to, to ask you a little bit about like how you felt when you were writing it, because when I was watching it and I told, I told the group this, that I felt like a lot of your idea, it's, it's like you, you wrote all of your ideas and you made it all come out. It, it, for me seemed kind of cathartic that you were able to let all of these ideas out, but I kind of want to know how you felt writing all of this down. I mean, I felt pretty crazy while writing this movie. Um, I mean, I, honestly, I probably felt more sane while I was writing it, writing it while I was practically sitting down, but just where I was at in life, you know, the summer of 2020, uh, lots of things changing and kind of just watching, uh, the backdrop of the world and specifically like leadership in the United States and leading up to, you know, possible re-election and all of these things that were just terrifying. Mm. And I, I think all, maybe all of that fear and anxiety poured its way into the film in one way or the other, like whether or not it's about that is, is a different thing. But, um, yeah, I, it definitely just felt like, I don't know how much longer like society is going to function. And I think a lot of people that made this movie with me, I think, we felt that way going into it. We've certainly still felt that way while we were making the film, but you know, the making of any art is always cathartic. So, you know, the, whether or not this was an actual valid concern, I think a lot of us felt like, you know, is this the last movie we're ever going to make? You know, because wow. it felt like, you know, there was just so much uncertainty and, you know, that maybe emphasized a lot of people kind of giving it their all and kind of throwing everything at this film and not being afraid of, 
you know, touching on taboos or anything like that, it really did feel like, well, if this is the last movie we're going to make, let's just make the craziest thing that, um, you know, sort of exercises the most anxieties that we can. Um, and so it, it, it is a film that's very much informed by the time, um, mm. but, you know, not wanting to make a, a movie about the pandemic or making a movie about a virus or anything that was, you know, maybe a little too close to what was going on. Um, but yeah, this was, it was a crazy time and I, I certainly felt crazy, but you know, when I, when I finished it and shared it with some people, like started to show it to Graham Skipper and talk about it, you know, you get into that process of making it more than just about the script you wrote. It's about the people you're talking to about it and collaborating with and talking about it visually with the, with the DP that kind of makes it, um, more of a thing to focus on and not something to dwell on maybe. Well, well, you say that you didn't want to like make it a, a product that it's time, right? But I think, uh, w w what you actually did was you, you kind of made, um, an evergreen film because now everyone's saying that it's a Christmas horror film. Yeah. <laughs> is that, is that what you <laughs> intended to do? Well, you know, the, the Christmas thing probably came not at the beginning, but shortly after when we realized where I'd be shooting it and what time of year it would be. Sure. And then thinking about, you know, once you lock into a Catholic priest being the, uh, the lead of the film, um, you know, it felt, it felt good. And then you kind of open up that side of your brain that likes Christmas horror movies and all the opportunities to, you know, get the trees out and get the Christmas lights out and start to build a lighting scheme and an aesthetic and all of those things. I mean, that's, I don't know. It's kind of the great thing about making a genre film is it's just like all these different corners of your brain that you can unlock and different things that you like from different corners of horror and thriller and comedy and yeah, things like that. So, so two, um, two, uh, two Christmas horror films were released this year and Jeremy Gardner's in both of them. <laughs> this is true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, it's, um, his, his haircut is a, is a, is pretty obnoxious in the other one. <laughs> no, yeah. that was that that was very um, you know, Joe Vegas is a friend and I remember uh Oh, is he? Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, so I, it was very exciting to kind of get some photos and videos from the behind the scenes of them making that movie and Jeremy sending me stuff from set and seeing what he looked like and just That is so cool. Uh <laughs> Matt, immediately you, questioning what's going on with his hair, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you and Joe kind of have a same well, I don't know, based on the like visual aesthetic, you know, um, I, I see a lot of 70s influence in both of you, um, you know, in terms of the look and everything. That's really cool that you guys are, are friends. Um, uh, you know, he's a he's a very inspiring filmmaker to to know and to to be friends with, I, you know, him and him and his team, their output over the years has been incredibly impressive. And, uh, you know, he's, he's a guy who's a, a producer at heart as well. And, you know, I think the, the, the more I've gotten to meet filmmakers over the years and sort of see how, how they operate and how certain things come together is really helped inform the, uh, the way that I've, you know, tried to put movies together. But, um, yeah, Jeremy, well, you know, Graham's got a small part in that as well, but the two of them, uh, yeah, two Christmas movies this year. How about that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> two horror Christmas films. <laughs> and yeah. I, I love both of them. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask a little bit about going back to the topic of, um, because you said that you made making the, the lead character a Catholic priest and you came from a Catholic upbringing and there are a lot of taboo things in the movie, especially religion wise. Did you get any flack about your material because of it? Aside from um, Rigo's mom. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I guess specifically, um, like Catholicism in general, or are we talking more about like the abortion plot line? Uh, actually, you know what? There are so many things in this film that well, are. Well, I, 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 I do remember finishing the script and sharing it with, uh, the location sound mixer. And the day that he read it was the day, uh, that Ruth Bader Ginsburg had passed away. And that was a very sort of ominous feeling of like, I just finished the script and he's like, oh man, pretty, uh, pretty crazy timing and, you know, made a note of that. And it was always in the back of our heads. But I think kind of even the, even the crazier thing is that when it premiered on a Friday, the following Saturday is when Roe v. Wade was overturned in the States. Wow. And that fell. And there were definitely people making a point like, hey, I, you know, obviously there's no way that these things, uh, time out intentionally, but I think it was, maybe a difficult watch for some people in that first weekend because of Roe v. Wade being overturned. And I completely understand that. I mean, that was something that was, 
you know, very much on at the forefront of our minds with everyone that made the movie. Um, just sort of uh, how insidious this has become. And, you know, the, the se- separation of church and state, there is none. You know, like you're saying, it sounds like very similar in the Philippines. There's, mm-hmm. uh, I, I'm very curious to know what country or what region of the world uh, actually has a legitimate separation of church and state at this point. Sure. Yeah. That's no idea. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, as, far, as far as the movie as a whole goes, I mean, yeah, there are people who, you know, found it difficult to watch for that reason. You know, my mm-hmm. own mother included. Uh, mm. Who's a very religious person? You know, she had until some now. Words. She had some words with me uh, after she <laughs> saw it, <laughs> but you know that's that's just to be expected. I think um, I think it's always kind of in the back of your head that like you know maybe maybe the movie you're making is going to touch on some difficult stuff, but I think ultimately the practicality of just making a movie is so difficult that at a certain point you have to put things like that, like concerns about what other people are going to think sort of in the background because just the practicality of making something is so hard and you got to focus on the day-to-day um hopefully you make something that you write something and that the the core group that you show it to originally would raise any uh you know hard red flags about something that's maybe tonally off or you know seemingly uh horrible with intention that goes beyond what the film is about but you know i talked about a lot of those things with the cast initially when they read the script and i think all of us were in agreement that it was it was kind of walking walking a line that all of us agreed on that a lot of us felt similarly about so um you know i think you also really have to trust that core group of collaborators with these things before you put it out into the world yeah yeah that would be yeah that would be the most practical way people who are aligned with you <laughs> Yep. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. How about we go kind of like um into your background, Eric? Like uh what uh what are you you your influences as a filmmaker? Any favorite films, favorite directors? Well, I think, you know, like a lot of kids growing up um at the age that I did, you know, being in the 90s, you kind of grow up just, you know, Jurassic Park and a lot of the big Mm. blockbusters are kind of just like the coolest thing in the world. Um, You know, that was probably the movie that because I had the making of Jurassic Park on VHS, it was like where I first saw titles like director of photography or production designer that I even knew what those words were. Um, So, you know, you're, you're into that for a while and then working at a haunted house kind of exposes you to like, well, who is this guy? with the white mask and the butcher knife. And then you learn about Michael Myers. I mean, I probably saw clips of Halloween, Hellraiser, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I probably saw clips of those movies edited together on VHS that would play on TVs Mm -hmm. in the waiting line at the haunted house long before I ever saw the movies (laughs) in full. They had these like four by three TVs where people would wait in line and it was like a like a best of horror moment so it's like the scene from hellraiser where you know the guy's being torn apart it's like the end of but texas chainsaw end. massacre yeah. where leatherface is waving the chainsaw it was like this yeah. highlight reel that <laughs> you know i saw all of that kind of first and then you know that kind of opens up your horror mind and then you know you get a little bit older and you get into film theory or film history and then that kind of opens your mind up to you know, even deeper cut horror films, Italian horror, you know, J-horror, all all of this stuff that's like, you start to realize that it's beyond just these like American slashers that you grew up knowing that there's this whole international landscape and that every country or culture has its own sort of approach to what's scary. And, you know, they all kind of boil down to this like Mm -hmm. similar fear of the dark and the unknown. And, you know, you just kind of get into your 20s and your 30s. And if you're, you're still hooked on, the magic of filmmaking from when you first saw a Spielberg movie, but now you have this international canvas and like broader appreciation for film in general, you know, I think that can lead to someone who wants to make a movie. Mm. So you mentioned that, that you got into all kinds of horror and same thing with me. So I, I like horror, but because of this podcast, I've been exposed to all kinds of horror, even the horror that I didn't know I didn't like. I didn't know this kind of horror existed, but no, these people started making me watch all these types of movies. So now I know about all of these types of horror. So is there any kind of horror movie that you don't, that, any kind of horror that you don't enjoy watching? I mean, I wouldn't say that there's a type that I don't like. I mean, there's maybe 
like genres or subgenres that I just don't find myself watching as much yeah. as. Um, and I'm kind of struggling to think what the obvious one would be. Um, I mean, I find myself going through periods where I'm just not as interested in like slashers as I am something supernatural. But then that switches. Like right now, I'm watching way more slashers, obviously, than I am sort of like home invasion domestic stuff mm -hmm. because that's the movie that I just made. So a lot of it will kind of maybe also be informed by like what I'm writing. I mean, I've written lots of scripts with different genres that haven't been made. Um, but, you know, the, the couple that I've gotten off the ground have fallen within the sort of uh, domestic home invasion subgenre, which was certainly uh, a genre that kind of really messed with my head when I first saw like funny games was something, mm. you know, first time seeing funny games was big. First time seeing uh, this movie called Angst, this German movie, uh, this home invasion film. It's just kind of um, depraved and sickening, but very uh, beautifully shot in the sound track is amazing and it's, it's doing something with the other part of your brain that's not disgusted you're like sort of amazed and uh you know just absorbed by the beauty of it all um yeah i, th I think really you know the, a lot of international films probably when i'm late teens early 20s you know seeing uh seeing high tension for the first time you know i can remember the french extremity from like mm -hmm. 2005 through 2007 you know i was at the end of high school seeing those movies, you know, the Hills Have Eyes remake comes to theaters mm. and that kind of like felt like it was a fucking earthquake because <laughs> that was the first movie I distinctly remember friends who I saw it with walking out of. Mm. And I remember the scene specifically wow. that they walked out of it afterwards. And it felt like that movie in theaters in a multiplex felt like something really sort of like crazy and wrong. Like people were leaving during this movie. Um, but I stayed. I stayed all the way through. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, that was, uh, you know, all of the Saw movies were in theaters when I was in high school. And, you know, I was kind of hit or miss on a lot of the Saw films and what became known as torture porn. You know, I think yep. a lot of that stuff kind of got like a little out of control, but I think it only got out of control because it was kind of like drinking its own Kool-Aid at a certain point mm -hmm. where it was really kind of like leaning heavily into what it knew it was doing but i think a lot of the stuff that was coming out of france especially was really strong um Have yeah i don't know martyrs and then i haven't no Ugh. still haven't and i've still still not seen inside which is Graham, one of graham skipper's favorite films yeah. um you know there's a lot i haven't seen but what i saw during that time was very influential a lot of stuff that came out kind of towards the end of high school 2007 2008 had an impact on me both horror and non-horror um, but you know, I don't find myself, yeah, I haven't, I haven't watched a good ghost movie in a while, mm. like a good, a good, like classic haunted. I mean, there's a few that I can think of that I like, but that's a genre that I'd be curious to get back into. But yeah, I don't know. There's sort of this endless tapestry of genres to, to bounce in and out of. My, my last favorite ghost movie is, uh, The Night House. Yeah. That is yeah. so good. Yeah. It's very good. Yeah. Very, very good. Um, what do you call this? Uh, okay. So we talked about, uh, your, your, your favorite stuff. How about, uh, you know, we, we said that horror in 2022, we, it was an embarrassment of riches. Like there were so many good horror films this year. What, what, what were your standouts? Well, I really liked a wounded fawn a lot. Oh. Um, you know, we, I, we just talked to Josh Rubin and yeah, was, yeah, uh, yeah. That's, That's cool. He he's amazing in it. Um, Sarah's amazing in it. I mean, I got to meet her and Travis at Fright Fest last year, so I got to see that film um, on a pretty huge IMAX screen. I really didn't know much about it. I don't think that there was a trailer, but mm -hmm. seeing that and getting to know some of the people that made that movie was was very cool. Um, beautiful movie. Um, really kind of overwhelmed me the soundtrack and everything. Uh, and then I mean, there's this. I don't know. I saw, I, there were a lot of great movies I saw last year, but it's also probably the year that I'm maybe the most behind on just with mm. finishing up the leech and getting it out and trying to, yeah, you know, being the producer of this film, you're also the post production producer of the film, which means you're still going through deliverables for international sales. And, you know, even sure. though it's out through Arrow, there's still been a lot of work on the back end of it. 
you know, mm-hmm. being the the manager of the business side and everything as well. So there's a lot I'm behind on, but yeah, uh, I thought, you know, Christmas Bloody Christmas was a total blast. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it definitely seemed like maybe not even just like that the whole year was great, but that almost every month there was something really good. That every, was yeah, on. I totally yeah. agree. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, I'm, I, who knows what 2023 holds, but it, from a couple of films that are out already, it sounds like this is going to be a killer year as well. Yeah. Can't Ooh. wait. So excited for it. Well, thank you so, so much for joining us. We are so happy that we got to get you on this podcast. So thank you thank so you. much. Super yeah. lucky. <laughs> this yeah, was amazing. We... Please, please have me back. This was a blast. Oh, <laughs> awesome. That's fantastic. Okay, now we're gonna, we, we are going to take you up on that, Eric. Um, Please do. This is, uh, it's a great time. Awesome. Okay, so so our general our theme is like we ask people to come in and just recommend a horror movie they love, and then we just talk about that. So if if we okay. could have you back to do that, that would be so cool. Awesome. Yeah, it would be an honor. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. And everyone listening, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Dead Air with Eric Pennykoff. And if you want to check out the group as well, please join our Facebook group. Uh, let's talk about more horror things, shows, books, anything that you want horror related. And please check out our Facebook group as well, Dead Air, a horror podcast. And check out our Instagram at Dead Air Pod. There you go. So thank you so much again. And um, yeah, we'll see you again. You said that. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, before we head out, um, do you want to tell us about, uh, you know, any of any upcoming projects and where where people can find you? Uh, well, I'm on Twitter and I'm on Instagram. If you just search my name, it'll show up. I believe I'm the only Eric Pennykoff. Mm-hmm. Uh, as far as upcoming projects, you know, I've got a couple things I'm trying to get off the ground. Um all I really know is that whatever I do, it's just not going to be in the snow again because that was fucking cool. <laughs> <laughs> Never again. <laughs> yeah. What, 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 what is the weather like in the Philippines right now? Maybe I should come over there and make something. Yes, it's, because it is... It's like 35 degrees or something. It's cold now. So it's yeah. like okay. 20... Yeah, this, this is cold. 27. Yeah. This yeah. is cold. cold. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So thanks again, and I hope everyone enjoyed this episode. So check us out at Dead Air, a horror podcast, and subscribe. Thank you, everyone. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Brought to you by Big Baby Studios.